of a talk to follow up. So I'm delighted this evening to introduce to you Bob Gilbert. He's a prolific writer and a very active environmental campaigner on urban wildlife. He's a, as well as writing books and articles for newspapers, he's a contributor to TV and radio as well. His fascination with the natural world and his knowledge of urban ecology really shine through his work. Tonight, he's agreed to speak to us on some enigmatic nature stories. And his talk is entitled, The Missing Musk and the Underground Mosquito. Stop sharing my screen and hand you over to Bob Gilbert. Thank you. In 1913, all the musk plants in the world stopped smelling. Here was a plant that was hugely popular, grown everywhere from country gardens to working class windowsills, and entirely for the fragrance that was reflected in its name. And yet that fragrance had suddenly and globally gone. When I first heard this story told to me by an elderly man who sat at his garden table in the Yorkshire Dales, I was understandably sceptical, even though he seemed old enough to me to have been there at the time. But he swore to the truth of his tale, though he could provide no explanation for it. In fact, it took only a little subsequent digging for me to, um, sorry, for me to substantiate the gist of what he had said. It was a plant that had once been the centre of a massive horticultural trade, but it existed in this country now only as a sporadic wetland wildflower. And in all of my plant books, the description of its once vaunted fragrance were prefixed with the puzzling word, forma. The juxtaposition of mystery and natural history was something I could not resist. Those are the opening paragraphs uh, uh, from my new book, and I'm very... Uh, pleased and honoured actually to be invited to speak to you about it today. It's a book called The Missing Musk, a case book of, niche, of mysteries from the natural world. But before I go on to read you the remaining 300 pages, let me tell you, I am actually a member of the London Natural History Society and I was rather disturbed when I was preparing this talk um, to, to work out that I'd been a member for nearly half a century. Uh, and I owe the society a great deal. A lot of my early Bird watching, for example, was done on society trips to Minsmere or on walking around Hampstead Heath with Kate Springett, where I first learned to distinguish a stock dove from a wood pigeon. Or on uh, early, my early botanizing was done on trips with people like Ted Lousley to Hamland or to the waterways of East London, where I, where I uh, learned to recognize the, the London uh, marigold or gypsy wort or lesser skullcap and and, and some tropical grasses whose names I confess I have now completely forgotten. Um, nonetheless, despite those 50 years of, of membership, it is rather daunting, especially having listened to those section reports, it is rather daunting to be addressing a company of so many experts in so many fields, because I regard myself as an expert in nothing in particular, um, as a storyteller, um, perhaps more than a scientist. So um, when it gets to the questions, keep them simple, please, and um, forgive any errors that you come across along the way. Actually, I'm going to reword that last bit. Um, one of your revered honorary vice presidents, John Swindles, um, did me a particular service in proofreading every chapter of my book. So if you do find any mistakes, can you blame them entirely on him, please? Now, to return to that opening paragraph that I just read you, I said that I couldn't resist the combination of mystery and natural history. Well, that was a bit of an untruth, really, because life intervened, uh, children, work, even the washing up got in the way. And it was some 30 years before I got round to investigating that story that I was talking about. This loss, sudden loss of fragrance by the musk plant. But that hiatus did have a function because it alerted me, having found one enigma, it alerted me to, to the idea of collecting others. Um, and, and I don't mean things like the Loch Ness Monster or the Yeti or, 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 or the Beast of Bodmin or the Devon, Devon Black Dog. I mean things for which there were evidence, but for which no scientific explanation had yet been given. Or 
perhaps I should say, which no agreed scientific explanation had yet been given. I don't mean the exotic, I mean what I came to call the extraordinary in the everyday. So I accumulated stories such as the mysterious substance that has been known for hundreds of years as star jelly. Um, I, I, I came across the case of the Blanford black fly. I collected stories of self-anointing hedgehogs um, or accounts of, of stoat processions and, 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 and reputed stoat funerals. Um, and it was from this collection of stories, and not all of those incidentally that I've mentioned, uh, most of those actually didn't make it into the book, but it was from those collections that I compiled this book of six uh, different mysteries of the natural world that I set out to try and solve. Um, and I'm going to talk about a bit of, about one of them a bit more in, in a moment. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the title, the title story, The Case of the Missing Musk. And I, I'm going to talk about that just a bit because it illustrates what I found out more and more as I was writing the book, which is, which is that whenever you find an answer, it actually seems to lead to a bigger question. Um, and in this case, one of the things it led to was a genuine murder mystery. Now, I realise that you are all serious scientists, but I, I, I'm sure you can do with just a little bit of titillation. So I wanted to tell you that story in particular. Um, botanists and gardeners among you will be familiar, I think, with the genus Mimulus, the monkey flowers. Um, and I should say for botanical accuracy that it's recently changed its name to Erianthra. I hope I pronounced that right, Erianthra. But it, most people still refer to them as Mimulus, and that's what I'm going to stick with for this talk. And there are many garden varieties of, of this family. There's Mimulus luteus, Mimulus luteatus. Uh, both of them, I think, occur in the wild in this country now. But they're also garden plants. They have the, these lovely uh, deep throats with, with spotted, beautiful spotted colours within them. Uh, I grew some of them in my window box this year, in fact. The musk plant, Mimulus muscatus, is a number, another member of that family, but it is not nearly as showy. It is a rather sprawling plant with less showy yellow flowers. It has, or rather did have, one big advantage. It had a smell that was said to be strong enough to scent out an entire room. That plant was native originally to, to the areas we now know as, uh, as we now know as Northwest USA or Southwest Canada or British Columbia, and the man who originally collected them there and brought them back to this country was David Douglas. Uh, sitting on our suburban lawns, looking at the neatly clipped edges, the well-tended herbaceous border, maybe um, sipping a pims in our deck chairs in summer. It is hard to recall now the real hardships uh, that many of our early plant collectors went through to, to, to populate our suburban plots. David Douglas walked and sometimes rode for hundreds, possibly thousands of miles. In fact, he's credited from having walked from the Pacific coast of America right through to the Atlantic coast of America. And on the way, he, he waded rivers, he canoed, he capsized, he climbed mountains, he crossed torrents, he had encounters with bears, he had encounters with sometimes uh, unfriendly local peoples. Uh, yet on the way, he collected many of our most familiar garden plants. Among them were species <coughs> of species of lupin, delphinium, honeysuckle, potentilla, flocks. He collected the snowberry, you know, the snowberry, which, which the leaves are now off those bushes, but those white berries are still are still there. He collected Garia elliptica, uh, the silk tassel plant with those beautiful catkins that look like the tassels at the base of some really ornate curtain. I went to a christening recently, and as we left, all the guests were given packets of seeds of something called baby blue eyes. That was another of the plants collected by David Douglas, but perhaps most importantly, he brought six new species of conifer to this country, and they included uh, the Sitka spruce, which is now the most commonly planted uh, plantation tree in Britain. He also collected Douglas fir, named, <laughs> someone's just 
put this up at that very second. The Doug, he, he brought to this country the Douglas fir, which is named after him, indeed, and which is actually uh, the tallest tree in Britain now. In fact, at one point, uh, I went up somewhere near Dunkeld to see the tallest Douglas fir, the tallest tree in, in Britain, Dunkeld in Scotland, only to find it had blown down the week before. Um, so I might not have seen the tallest tree, but I have seen the longest tree in Britain. And, and for the person who was asking that question, incidentally, do try Douglas fir gin, um, which, of course, I had to sample while researching the book. It's a Christmas tip for you. Really is delicious. Anyway, so he, he, he collected all these things and, and after these kind of really arduous days. And he still and he still managed to sit down and write a journal in his camp, in his tent at the end of the day. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I, I can hardly manage to kind of read three pages of a book without falling asleep of an evening. But he would sit down and he would write this, this, this journal at the end of it every day. One of the great pleasures of researching the book was that I went to the archives at the Royal Horticultural Society in Vincent Square. Uh, and I went down in, in, into, a, into a special room in the basement with a special temperature and they brought out the original diaries the original journals of, of David Douglas, and I had to read them on, on special cushions. And to see these handwritten journals, it really was a wonderful thing. So I, I learned a lot about the life of David Douglas, but what I also learned about was his, his rather mysterious end. He was um, returning from his central trip to, to, to uh, the states of Oregon and British Columbia, as they were then, um, and he stopped on the way at Hawaii, uh, which was then known. I'm just going to try and get rid of those tweets because they keep coming up in the corner of my screen. Um, he stopped on his way home at on Hawaii, um, which, as I say, was then known as the Sandwich Islands. And because his boat was delayed and because he was David Douglas, he decided he walk the length of the island in the intervening period and, and climb all its mountains. So he was in the process of doing that. And he stayed one night with a man called Edward Gurney or Ned Gurney. Now, Gurney was an escaped convict. Gurney had escaped from Botany Bay and he'd made his way to the Sandwich Islands and he was making a living uh, as a hunter of wild cattle. And the way you hunted wild cattle was to dig pits and then to cover the pits with, with, with brush and wait for the cattle to fall in them and then you'd go and shoot them. It seems a kind of rather one-sided form of hunting to me, but that's how it was done. So Douglas stayed with Gurney and he set out in the morning. And according to Gurney's testimony, Gurney says that he tried to persuade him to wait for a local guide, but Douglas was keen to get going. So Gurney went a short distance along the trail with him, pointed out where these traps were, these pits were, and then left him to it. And later in the same day, um, some local people came by and saw one of these pits had been broken open and they looked inside and there was David Douglas, the body of David Douglas, with a wild bull standing over it. And they called Gurney. Gurney shot the bull and they retrieved the body. Uh, and they then took the body by canoe to Hilo, which was where the, the missionary station, which is where uh, David Douglas had been heading. And the missionaries inspected the body and they really didn't feel that the wounds on the body were consistent with goring by a wild bull. So they packed up the body in salt and they sent it up to the High Commissioner by canoe again, the High Commissioner in Honolulu. The High Commissioner looked at the case for a while and then declared it must have been an accidental death. But ever since then, more and more doubts have been accumulating. There were doubts, as I say, about the nature of the wounds there was also testimony from the person that David Douglas had stayed with the night before Gurney, who said that he had far more money in his bag than was there when Gurney handed it in to the authorities. And then at the beginning of this century, more evidence came to light from the archives of the botanical, uh, of the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens, some documents suggesting that um, Gurney's wife had actually had a romantic attachment to, had feelings for David Douglas. Um, and uh, 
possibly never acted upon, but that this has created some tension and jealousy. So the question in the end is, did he fall or was he pushed or was he maybe killed and then thrown into the pit? Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that story because it, it shows how I started out with a plant investigation and, and came to include a, a murder mystery in the book. There is one or two, in fact. And in the rest of my investigations into the musk, one of the things I wanted to find out, um, one of the things I wanted to find out was why he, um, sorry, what the musk might actually have smelt like. And to do that, I, I located the musk rose, but I also looked at, I looked for all of the plants, all of the wild flowers in this country which had musk in their name. Uh, and you were referring, uh, Gerham was referring to the quizzes um, you do. So here's a little quiz for you. Um, see if you can note down for me. All of the plants, all of the wildflowers in this country that you're aware of that have musk in their name. And we can check at the end whether it's the same as the list that I made. All the plants that have musk in their name. But I went around searching those, those flowers and seeing if I could recover what the smell of the musk might actually have been like. I also went to look for musk plants in, in the wild. The closest to London I found them was in a campsite in, in Suffolk. Uh, but the best place I found them was um, alongside the River Kelvin in urban Glasgow, where I found them several times. But of course, what I was most interested in is, is trying to learn whether the musk plant lost its smell quite as quickly as the story relates and to find out the reason for that. Now, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not actually going to reveal the total answer to that. Um, but I will say two things. It, it is absolutely true. The musk plant lost its smell globally, but not quite as suddenly as the story suggests. It took place over a period of 30 or 40 years. And the question in the end came to be not so much why did the musk plant lose its smell, but why did it have a smell in the first place? And I'll leave you with that slightly enigmatic ending to, to, to that. Um, as I say, there were six stories that I selected to go in the book. Um, and there was one I was going to tell you about a little more detail, and I chose it simply because it is based in London. It's London-centric. For years, I had heard these hints and rumours that um, of mosquitoes in the London underground, although I had never seen them myself. And I really wanted to find out what was there, is there, was this insect really living a completely subterranean life in London, or was it just an urban myth? And if it was true, how did it get there? How was it surviving? And what did it tell us about evolution? Um, and I'm going to begin this in, in, in perhaps uh, what you might find a slightly surprising way. I'm going to wax lyrical about mosquitoes. I do know that on the one hand, they have been characterized as the most dangerous animal in the world. They are the vector for malaria and not just for malaria, but for, for a whole litany of viruses and medical conditions. Yellow fever, dengue fever, Lassa fever, Nile, West Nile fever, encephalitis, elephantitis, Zika virus, Mayora virus, chikungunya. Uh, and they have actually shaped the course of human history. Times, holiday melodies come together in this holly jungle concert. Sorry, I'm getting... Oh, I'm getting some feedback on this. Anyway, um, they have shaped the course of human history. Um, on the other hand, you cannot deny that they are marvelous pieces of evolutionary engineering. In the words of the psalm, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Humans uh, seem to have a particular aversion to long legacy creatures, to, to house spiders, to crane flies, to harvest men. Yet it, 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 in the mosquito, the long legs actually serve to raise the center of gravity, to distribute the weight, the weight more evenly. So the, the insect is even less detectable when it lands on you. Stand on me weightless, you phantom, uh, said D.H. Lawrence. He wrote a very long poem about mosquitoes. Stand on me weightless, you phantom. 
And then there is the wings, that the wing of the female mosquito vibrates up to 600 times a second. The, the sound of the mosquito, that annoying, persistent whine is, of course, a mechanical sound. And it is the wings rubbing against a comb-like structure on the thorax of the, of, of the insect, a, a structure, incidentally, that was only disco discovered in 1902 by British scientists. Um, the wings of the male vibrate at a lower pitch. So this all has a function in mating. When the female detects the male, she reduces the, the, the frequency of her wing beats, thus lowering the, the pitch of her whine, and the male increases his. And they do that until the two reach a rough match, and then they, and if that, if that is achieved, they mate. So, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is the love song of the mosquito. But the most amazing and wonderful part of the mosquito to me is, is the mouth parts, the proboscis. Now, in my naivety, when I started looking into this, I assumed that it was just a, a simple syringe, uh, you know, insert, suck, withdraw. In fact, there are six different parts to the proboscis of, to the mouth parts of the mosquito, all of them enclosed within a retractable sheath. So the mosquito will first withdraw the sheath and then it will insert two parts which have serrated edges and, and, and with an up and down zigzag movement, they will cut very rapidly into the flesh, so sharp that they cannot be detected. And once that's done, it will insert two more parts which will hold the sides of the wound open. You know, just like a surgeon using retractors in an operation. And only then will it insert the sucking part, which, uh, which is tough, but also flexible, so that it can probe about and it has chemical receptors in its tip, which guide it to a vein. And only then is the sixth part uh, used, and it's the sixth part which releases a saliva, a, a, an anticoagulant, which of course will speed up the feeding time and reduce the amount of time in which it might be detected. And as you probably know, it's that saliva, it's that anticoagulant that actually caused the irritation of a mosquito bite. And then um, how does actually, how does the mosquito find you in the first place? Well, the female mosquito has 72 different receptors in her antennae, 72 receptors using a whole range of clues to, to detect and approach her prey. Um, I say the female, I stress the female because it's only the female, actually, which feeds on human blood. The male is a lot more innocent creature. Uh, the male feeds on nectar and on rotting fruit juices. But the female, when she's feeding, incidentally, she will, feed, she will, she will, she will uh, take in more than three times her own body weight in blood. And while she's doing that, she will... Um, extract and um, excrete the water, condensing the blood even more as she takes in. And the fact, of course, that it's the female doing this gives you a clue as, as, as the reason for the blood feed. The blood feed is essential for egg laying. Now, most species of mosquito will lay their eggs immediately after a blood feed, but some can retain the blood for longer, uh, and they are called autogenous. Uh, species. And uh, there's a reason for this distinction, which I'll come to a bit later on. It becomes important later on in this talk. Right. So there are at latest count 34, it does vary from time to time, 34 species of mosquito living in the UK. And they live in a variety of habitats, including woodland, wetland, gardens, occasionally my bathroom. And, but do they occur underground as well. Well, what I found out was that they are not only there, but they have been there for at least 70 years. In fact, they arrived in the underground as far as I could detect uh, with the onset of the Blitz, of the London Blitz in 1940. <clears throat> it's interesting that um, 
In World War One, the, the government encouraged the use of underground shelters, of underground stations as shelters, uh, shelters from the Zeppelin raids. They even had a slogan for it, bomb proof down below. At the start of the World War II, the government took a very different view. Um, Churchill in particular wanted to prevent use of the underground stations. He believed that it would affect morale. Uh, he believed that something called, it would develop something called deep shelter mentality and that people once down there would not want to come back up again. But people, as they do, took matters into their own hand by the simple expedient of buying a, a, a penny halfpenny ticket, getting on the last train, and when they got off it, simply refusing to leave the station. And there were even big gatherings and demonstrations. One particular uh, was outside, a very large group of protesters uh, outside Liverpool Street Station. And then when the Blitz started in September 1940, the government relented and allowed the use of the stations as shelters. And by October, 125,000 people a night were sleeping in the underground. I think we have a kind of popular image of that as a kind of, you know, of, of, of bonhomie, as though it was one long Cockney party. And it is true that to some extent an amazing community did develop. People used to take down wind up gramophones and musical instruments. They organised concert parties. They organised amateur dramatics. Some underground stations even had their own libraries and, and there were canteen trains travelling around these stations. I came across this figure. By the end of the world, the canteen trains had served 545,454 gallons of tea. But I think this kind of rather rosy picture is not quite the, it doesn't quite uh, capture the reality of, of life down there in the underground. Here's another extract from the book. Much of this rosy view of life underground arises from the effectiveness of government propaganda, and it still prevails today. The truth is, however, that despite the best efforts of many, conditions in the tube shelters were grim. People were packed unpleasantly close together, sleeping on uncomfortable surfaces, spreading coughs and colds, hardly able to even turn in their sleep, and fearful of what might be going on above. There was competition for places, and fights over spaces, and sanitary conditions were appalling, with just a few L-sand toilets or buckets shared between hundreds of people. Incidentally, those conditions did improve as they uh, adopted new facilities later on in the war. According to Len Phillips, who lived through it as a child, the worst part was the smell, the smell of bodies and of other unmentionable things. In addition, you could hear everything that was going on up the top, you could hear the bombs. You could hear the guns that echoed down the lift shafts. I hated it, to be frank. It is the smell that figures too in the account of Evelyn Rose, also a child at the time. The stench was unbearable. The smell was so bad, I don't know how people did not die from suffocation. So many bodies and no fresh air coming in. But if you think of those female um, mosquitoes with the 72 receptors in their antennae here of course was an open invitation the stink the sweat the body heat uh, would have attracted mosquitoes for miles around some of course would have been carried in, in the paraphernalia that people took down into the stations they took down uh, deck chairs and hammocks and blankets and all sorts of things but many more would have uh, found their own way guided by that stink and the first logged complaints of mosquito bites ironically came from liverpool street station uh, that was the first ones that i found liverpool street station but soon they were being reported almost daily and from all over the system from clapham common in the south up to hampstead in the north so uh, the underground authorities went in to investigate and what they found, not just that the mosquitoes were there, but they were breeding there. They were breeding in shallow pools of water and in the inverts under the platforms. Uh, so eventually the underground employed up to 10 men 
uh, equipped with sprays and compressors and aerial disinfectants whose job it was to, to go around and try to deal with what they called the mosquito menace. I, the instructions I found in one document were discontinue while shelterers are sleeping, recommence during coughing period in the morning. Uh, that phrase, the coughing period in the morning, I love that. I think that tells you almost everything you need to know really about conditions um, uh, living, uh, sleeping on, on the underground. And I found a letter um, that was sent in 1941 from someone called the, the officer in charge of shelter, of tube shelterers. And it was sent to all medical, all medical office, offices of health. And I'll just read you a bit of that. Measures are being taken to overcome the mosquito trouble at stations. Due to the rise in temperature caused by the presence of shelterers and the opportunity for mosquitoes to obtain a blood meal, the tubes have developed mosquitoes where none existed before. I'm glad to say that with the help of Dr. Stock and his mosquito experts, good progress is being made and the nuisance is well under control. Help will be afforded if upon hearing of any sudden recurrence at any station, you could arrange immediately to telephone the board's building department. Time is of the essence in subduing these marauders. And upon receipt of the information, the mosquito staff will proceed to the spot at once. I love the urgency in that. Now, it, it seems to me that some of those medical officers of health would have been old enough to have remembered the time when malaria was actually an English disease. You may be surprised to know that malaria occurred in this country. Uh, in fact, annual recording of malaria cases only ceased in 1919. It was, uh, it was a less deadly plasmodium than the tropical, um, than, than, than the tropical uh, uh, malaria plasmodium, but it was nonetheless uh, very unpleasant and uh, very debilitating and caused lots of deaths, particularly in children. Um, and, and so for hundreds of years we'd had this, uh, but we knew it largely as the swamp fever or as ague. Um, there were some quite famous sufferers, in fact, uh, from this swamp fever, from, from the ague. Um, one of them was Walter Riley. When, when Walter Riley was beheaded, he, he, said, um, he said to the executioner, uh, hasten, man, hasten, my ague comes on. He did not want to be seen trembling in case people thought that it was fear. Um, another sufferer was Charles II, but also ironically, uh, so was his great nemesis, Oliver Cromwell. By Cromwell's time, a cure or rather a, um, an alleviate, um, an amelioration for malaria had been found in the form of quinine. And, and quinine was, uh, came from the quinoa Bark, and it had been shown to Jesuit missionaries by the native peoples of Peru. So it was known as Jesuit powder. And Oliver Crom Cromwell refused to use what he regarded as a popish memory. He said he didn't want a, a, a popish remedy. He said he didn't want to be Jesuited to death. So actually, Oliver Cromwell died of malaria instead. But mostly, of course, it was not so much the rich and the well-known, it was the poor people. Uh, particularly the poor rural people who suffered from uh, the, the ague, and it affected a very large area of what had been characterised of the eastern English lowlands, an area which extends from southeast Yorkshire down through Lincolnshire, the Wash, East Anglia, Essex, up the Thames Estuary to the London marshes, and down through Kent to Romney Marsh, uh, Pet Level, and Pevensey. And, and incidentally, I am. I am walking that entire coastline. I'm, I'm heading north. I've got as far as um, Mablethorpe in Lincolnshire, and I'm actually sitting talking to you, um, which is why we've, we've, we've faded the background a bit from, from, from a small uh, bedroom in, in a bread and breakfast in Skegness at the moment uh, as part of that journey. But anyway, in London, uh, Lambeth and Westminster marshes were particularly notorious for regular epidemics of malaria. They were recorded throughout the 19th century, particularly the hot summers of 1857 and 1859. 
And according to the military physician, Sir William MacArthur, of all the patients treated in St. Thomas's Hospital between 1850 and 1860, one in 20 had the ague. Uh, and, it, and, and in bad years, it was many more. If you travel a little to the east, too, you get to Gravesend. And in Gravesend Hospital, 30% of the patients had malaria. And of course, just beyond to the east of um, Gravesend is the North Kent Marshes. And the North Kent Marshes, apart from being a great bird watching area, was also one of the last um, strongholds of malaria in this country. It also happens to be the site of one of the um, most famous literary references to malaria. I, I found references to, to malaria in or the ague in, in Chaucer, in Samuel Butler, in Shakespeare, uh, particularly in, um, I've just forgotten the name of the play, but anyway, in Shakespeare. Uh, but the best known reference is in um, Dickens in the book, Great Expectations. And in those wonderful opening scenes where he describes those North Kent marshes. And he also describes the graveyard where his younger brothers and sisters were buried. And, and that is based on Cooling Churchyard. And I don't know whether any of you have been there, it's really worth a visit because there you have these 14 lozenge shaped graves in descending size. And they are all the children from just two families, all of whom died in infancy from, from the ague. And in, in, in later in the same chapter, Magwitch, the convict uh, appears, rears up suddenly uh, on this misty morning from behind a gravestone. And if you read the account, Magwitch is very clearly suffering from malaria, which is not at all surprising because he was a convict. He'd escaped from the convict hulks on the, hulks on the Thames estuary. And those hulks were also strongholds for malaria. I found um, one case, the, the, a, a boat called the Justicia, where there were 157 cases of malaria in just three months. And, and just as a, a little aside, I, I had read once that the red dead nettle, the plant red dead nettle, was known on those North Kent, Kent marshes as the convict, convict flower. So when I was uh, exploring the area, I looked for it and, and I could not find a single plant of red dead nettle, which puzzled me until I remember that red dead nettle is a plant of disturbed ground. So it almost certainly grow, grew on the ho hastily thrown up piles of earth above the graves of those convicts being buried from the hulk. So at least they had that little flower to, to celebrate. Yeah. But to return from North Kent to the, uh, to the London underground, um, after the war, the overnight crowds obviously disappear from the underground, but the mosquito lingers on and it occurs in, in, in the complaints of, of passengers, but more of staff and particularly of maintenance workers. But it doesn't attract much attention until the late 1990s. And it was in the late 1990s that a woman called Catherine Byrne from the uh, University of London, a geneticist, begins to uh, walk the tunnels with maintenance workers and collect specimens of the mosquitoes down there. And then working with her colleague, Rich Richard Nichols, she subjects them to protein analysis and she studies these mosquitoes, she rears them, um, and she publishes her results in, a, in an article in a journal called Heredity in 1999. And in this article, she reveals some really fascinating things about the life cycle of these mosquitoes. The mosquitoes she's collecting are a, a species called Culex pipiens, and Culex pipiens is the commonest form of mosquito in this country. And the among the interesting things she discovers is that there is a completely different lifestyle between Culex pipiens that are living above ground and the populations that are living below ground. Culex pipiens above ground um, is uh, that they, they take that they're, some of asking me a question, they are native. Culex pipiens is a native uh, mosquito of this country. Um, the Culex pipiens above ground has an annual hibernation. The population now living below ground 
has completely dispensed. Living in a constant temperature, in constant, fairly warm conditions, it has dispensed completely with hibernation. Culex pipians, which live above ground, um, they mate, the males form mating collars and, and the females fly towards this. In the constricted conditions of the underground, they can no longer do that, so they mate individually. The Culex pipians above ground need a blood meal. The females need a blood meal immediately before egg laying. The ones below ground have become autogenous. I told you I would refer, return to that word. They've become autogenous. They can, they can retain the blood for a period. But what seemed most significant to me was that Culex pipians above ground feeds on birds, feeds only on birds. And this below ground population has adapted to feeding on humans and perhaps other mammals as well. Well, how, how did this happen? According to Byrne, there was a single colonizing event. The mosquitoes enter the tube system and it's followed by a very rapid process of evolution. And she suggested that it was so rapid that there was evidence that different strains of mosquito were forming on different lines. In other words, that there would eventually be a central line mosquito, a Victoria line mosquito, a Bakerloo line mosquito, and so on. And this conclusion, it caused huge interest, as you can imagine, mainly for the reason that it challenged orthodox Darwinian theory. Instead of evolution being something that, uh, you know, uh, that was a sequence that went on bit by bit, small changes taking place over thousands and possibly millions of years, here was evolution happening with great rapidity in decades in, in the course of one lifetime. And this, this conclusion, it, 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 was, it, it featured in newspapers, it featured in articles, it was repeated again and again in books, some of which incidentally have been um, uh, uh, reviewed in the LNSS journal. Uh, it was summed up in a headline in, in one journal called Lateral in, in 2015, with the title, The Fastest Show on Earth. So this was the kind of fascinating outcome of, of this study of mosquitoes in the underground, that they were, to, they were evidence of this amazing, amazingly rapid evolution. Except, uh, except, um, I don't have a problem with a challenge to orthodox Darwinism, by the way, and, and in other chapters um, of the book, I actually challenge it in a couple of ways myself. And I hope to rain on what seems a rather interesting and exciting parade, but I don't actually agree with this conclusion. Because digging about in various archives, which included the British Library and the Wellcome Institute, and can I just say at this point that I have used the LNHS Library uh, in researching several of my books. So thank you for uh, librarians and volunteers there. Um, but going into these archives, I did find something different. For example, in 1923, a malariologist and entomologist called Pete, Percy George Shute was asked to investigate a mosquito nuisance in central London. And he found on bedroom walls and ceilings Culex pipians, specimens of Culex pipians, which were actually gorged with human blood. This is in 1923. And even more interesting was the case of John Marshall. John Marshall, incidentally, uh, was a, a fascinating character, and, and I write quite a bit about him in the book, which I can't go into here. But he was, he was a, a complete amateur who went on to be one of the world's leading experts on the uh, on mosquitoes. He came originally from Croydon, although he settled on Hailing Island, so he has a London connection. And he also wrote the great seminal work, still I think the seminal work on mosquitoes, The British Mosquito, and, and I, I, I really uh, felt privileged to handle first editions of that book in, in the British Library. He was convinced that this mosquito, Culex pipians, fed only on birds. And, and at, at one time, he put his assistant, he didn't do it himself, he put his assistant semi-naked in a cage 
of Culex pipians and, and, and left them there for several hours and recorded that they didn't once feed uh, on, on humans or on, on his assistant. Uh, and, and I even found a letter that he'd later written to his daughter in Italy, rebuking her in very round terms because she'd made the suggestion that she'd seen Culex pipians feeding on human blood. Well, he later was forced to change his mind and he had to write a whole paper about um, autogenous human feeding Culex pipians. But he, interestingly, made records of them, uh, particularly in urban areas, and he recorded finding them in hotels in Charing Cross and in flats in Westminster. And he says there was a concentration of them, particularly in the region of Trafalgar Square. <clears throat> so far from evolving in the tunnels, it seems to me that there was a strain of Culex pipians in central London that was, had already evolved to feed on human blood. So here is what I think happened. During the Blitz, a variety of mosquitoes find their way into the underground, some on the paraphernalia that people carried in with them, some attracted by the smell, the heat, the chemical si signals. Um, from the records, we know there were several types of um, mosquito originally, including a Theobordia annulata, which is the one incidentally that I found on my bathroom wall, but also Culex pipians. <clears throat> and amongst those Culex pipians must have been some of this strain of human feeding, autogenous mosquito, uh, Culex pipians that we know already were resident in central London. So after the war, the other species die out. Um, but the Culex pipians finding these stable conditions, this, this constant warmth, this, this water for breeding, this, this regular food supply, have everything they need for a, a permanent home. And that, I believe, is the origin of the underground mosquito, the London underground mosquito. Of course, like all answers, it actually raises further questions. Um, are they continuing to evolve underground? What status have they had since COVID and the great reduction of the number of passengers during that prolonged period? And more significantly, what on earth are the males feeding on? If the females are feeding on human blood, what are the males who normally feed on nectar and rotting fruit? What are they feeding on? Uh, and that was, and I'll just say this in conclusion, in, that was kind of a, a lesson throughout the book from me that um, <clears throat> I think I started it, um, that, that, every, that, every, that every answer led to a question. I, I think I started it rather in the, in the spirit of a character from an Agatha Christie book. You know, I would be Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple. I would investigate clues, visit the scene of crime, gather information, interrogate the facts. In short, I would crack the case wide open. Uh, and instead, of course, I found this, this every answer leading to a new questions and sometimes very big ones. Um, when I was looking at star jelly, it, it raised the whole question of subjectivity in science. When I was looking at the little creatures known as tardigrades or, or moss piglets or water bears. It, it raised um, questions of the possibly interstellar origins of life. And in fact, even definitions, how we define life and death itself. When I was trying to looking at the identity of life, it raised questions about what is a species? What is an individual? Can I say that I'm an I? And the role that cooperation has played in evolution. So I think in, in, in writing this book in the end, I came to the idea of respecting mystery, that our task was not so much to dispel mystery, um, but to go more deeply into it. Um, and I'll quote with a, a quote, I'll, I'll finish, I mean, with a quote from Einstein, as, as Einstein put it, the world is not only stranger than we can imagine, sorry, the world is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And that's a really um, good point to end on, I think. The idea that you find out a bit more and then it only just opens up a whole lot more 
um, things that need investigating and the, that process never stops, I, I think. It was, that was just a fascinating talk, really intriguing. Um, um, the story of the, mos the mosquitoes is just, it, it, that is just incredible. And there obviously are still some questions to be answered around that and about how things are changing as well for them. So um, oh, we've got some people saying that was a great talk already. Um, I'm going to just see if there are, um, Tony, I don't know if there are a couple of questions. I, I had a quick look through and there are lots of comments rather than questions. <laughs> you raised as many questions as we were going to, uh, to ask, I think, and answered some and carefully left some unanswered so we'd, we'd actually purchase your book and read it. So well done you, Bob. Um, comments that there are lots of comments about mice and it kind of raises a question i was going to ask as well which is mice are still really really common on the underground and are likely a really good source of feeding for females um and you only mentioned males uh, what they feed on uh, do you think there's a link between the amount of food that's deposited on the underground the survival of mice and the possible survival of those mosquitoes or, or gnats the culex um, yeah, I'm interested that you raise uh, uh, mice. That the the and 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 that you say that um, they're still very common because my my observation was different actually. My observation was that I, I have I have seen many fewer mice since COVID than I used to see as a regular passenger on the underground. I used to love watching the mice, particularly on a late evening return home. And I think I thought uh, that I've only seen them twice since COVID actually. And uh, so I think their numbers have, may have dropped because they what they feed on it, it is edible litter. That's what they feed on. And they, there are studies done of the underground mice, actually, and they have a different metabolism than overground mice. If I remember rightly, they, they, they are smaller and they move much more quickly and their metabolism works much faster. And I think they are living actually at the kind of edge of, you know, of their range. And so I was interested to, to know whether... Uh, COVID had affected the populations. I think it's a bit, it's a bit, bit localised. I mean, I certainly am one to, so I happen to travel quite late quite often. <laughs> and and at one point, I think we had five or six mice in the corner running around being incredibly bold and almost running up to people until they ran away from them. So they are there in, in local areas. But I mean, I've never seen the mosquitoes myself in the underground. And I'm an entomologist. I, I look for these things. So are they very abundant? Oh. No, see, I have never, and I have looked for them, and I have never seen a mosquito on the Lumbee Underground, which is why I thought, to begin with, that this was an urban myth. But it, it's not. They've been scientifically studied, and they are there. But I'd love to see one. <laughs> I mean, the other, the other obvious question is, how on earth do they survive the, the great pulses of, of pressure change? Going running through the tunnels? They, they weigh next to nothing, so they must be blown away quite easily. And yet they seem to have survived, well, decades before COVID, possibly. Um, um, well, the great pulses of, 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 of passing trains is what is said to have spread them, of course, from tunnel to tunnel. So wherever they came in from, it, it is the draft of passing trains that has spread them from tunnel to tunnel. And that is why uh, Catherine Byrne uh, thought that there was these different populations growing in developing in different tunnels and possibly becoming different subspecies. So it, it's rather like, um, you know, there's lots of stories, isn't there, about seeds of plants like the Oxford ragwort, which have been spread along the, the railway embankments by the draft of passing trains. And I, I kind of think the, 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 the spread of the mosquitoes in the underground is kind of analogous to those spread of, of seeds on, on the overground railways, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Andrew Plant commented on the fact that uh, virus pandemics in dense human populations. So again, alluding to, you, you talked about malaria, but of course our fear now of viral infections being spread. Um, so maybe there's, there's a lot of interest or should be a lot of interest in, in underground mosquitoes from that point of view. Sorry, I didn't quite, what was the comment? I didn't quite catch that. It, is, it was the fact that uh, relating uh, pa pandemics being spread by vectors such as mosquitoes, not just malaria, but the new viral and pandemics and the potential for their spread. So you can imagine, I, th I suppose it was supposition that if virus was actually to get into those mosquito populations, they could spread very quickly through the population of London in particular. 
Yes, there are. There is a government body which actually has the task of monitoring this this the the, the, the threat of introduced diseases, including from mosquitoes. Um, they they seem to give it a fairly low risk factor, and actually they thought that um, it, it was not malaria was not the, the highest possibility. It was some of the other viruses which were a greater possibility of being spread by mosquitoes because there are new mosquitoes coming into the country. There was that one called the Asian tiger. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Which was spreading quite rapidly. Um, mm. Yeah. So, so th there is an awareness of this possibility, and it is being monitored at the moment. Okay. Just to get off the. I mean, <laughs> we're all focused on mice and mosquitoes. Somebody has actually put in a comment about uh, um, uh, what, what about a list of the names containing musk? Or I think some oh. names of plants containing musk. What sort of musk plants are there? Um, but it's not too long. <laughs> no, 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 it's not too long. Let me see where I, I jotted it down at the, actually while I was. Right. So, listen, other people might have others. Um, but I found that the musk mallow, the musk stalkspill, the musk thistle, the musk orchid. And on top of that, muscatel. Muscatel actually means little musk. And on top of that, Lots of plants have local or country names, and there's, there's dozens of those, but one of them I can remember was that sea aster is also named as musk buttons. I didn't expect you to have the more obscure ones, but uh, and, oh, and wow. can I tell you a, a quick a quick story? I, I mentioned uh, John Swindles. I I, um, I read about musk stalksbill. I looked it up, and it, it, it was said it was found mostly in in, in south in the, in the West Country growing by the coast. So I was wondering where I could find this plant and I arranged to have uh, lunch with John Swindle so that he could tell me where I could look for it. And I, I arrived at this cafe and John had got there a bit before me and, and John didn't know why I was going and he jumped up and said, oh, Bob, I've just been looking at plants. I've just found musk stalkspill by the front door of the cafe. Anyway, it turns out the musk stalkspill is now abundant in, in London and uh, John Burton, I think it was, wrote an article about that in, in the journal. Uh, and it seems that musk stalkspill, which was once spread in the West Country by sheep, uh, has been brought into London by holidaymakers' dogs picking up the seeds in the West Country and, and brought, it, uh, brought it into London. And I tell you, now I've recognised that it is really abundant. So musk stalkspill, you can find almost everywhere in London now. We're all going to set off and look for it now, I think, well, in spring anyway. Excellent. Oh, no, you can recognise the leaves. Once you get the hang of it, you can see the leaves now. Excellent. You can tell I'm not a botanist. <laughs> I don't know if we've got one last uh, question to f or comment or anything to finish off with, um, cause, uh, Tony, because I think... Yeah, I think it's time to... Time. I, don't, I don't think so. I think, as I say, most of them are really comments and lots and lots of comments on how wonderful the talk was, and I agree with that. A really enjoyable talk, really informative, and an excellent way to finish an, an AGM. Yeah, thank you. And just the same thing from me, really. And yeah, lots of people really appreciated the talk. It has been recorded, so we will pop it onto our YouTube channel. So people, somebody said their iPad's about to go. So, um, but you can catch up later. And obviously people who weren't actually managed, weren't able to come along this evening will be able to watch as well. And I think it, I'm going to enjoy watching it. It's obviously when you're running things, you're kind of doing that at the same time. Um, so I'm going to enjoy watching it at my leisure as well. And I was, I must just say, I was delighted that you'd use the LNHS library because um, that's uh, another kind of thing I hope Leslie was listening to. Um, so if you would like to be like Bob, <laughs> please go along to the library at the next opportunity. Thank you again to everybody, to, obviously to Bob particularly for a wonderful talk. It was a really nice way to follow on from the AGM. But also thanks to everybody who contributed this evening, everybody who came along, everybody who's joined the society. If you haven't joined already, do think about joining for 2024 because we'd love to have you as members. And if you'd like to unmute yourself and say thank you or say goodbye before you go, please do. Our next uh, virtual talk will be on the 11th, I think it is, of January. Um, so do come along to that. Um, it's going to be about the Thames Estuary, so book tickets for that. How, if you're celebrating, have a very lovely Christmas and all the best for 2024 when we're going to have another exciting year at the LNHS. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.